It's time for Windows Weekly, episode 156. PC sales cross an amazing milestone. Paul announces the cessation of hostilities, and we take a look at gadgets in Windows 7. Windows Weekly is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 156 for May 14th, 2010. Phoenix Lights. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Go to Assist Express. If you're in tech support, solve problems fast with a leader in remote support software. Go to Assist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by Drobo, the original S Pro, Drobo FS, and new Drobo Elite, offering expandable storage products for individuals, small businesses, and creative teams. For more information and instant rebates, visit drobo.com slash windows. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything that's happening in that beautiful little village of Redmond over there on the right coast, left coast, left coast of the U.S. of A. That's where Paul Therott is headed next week. Paul is the uh, editor-in-chief of the super site for Windows, winsupersite.com. The news I'll editor. Never prove it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't prove it. One cannot prove the negative, can one? <laughs> He's also the news editor of Windows IT Pro, author of Windows 7 Secrets, and the up-and-coming Windows Phone Secrets. Ladies and gentlemen, from Dedham, Massachusetts, weighing in at 160 pounds. Or so. <laughs> in the blue trunks, <laughs> Paul Farratt. Let's get ready. It's a rumble? I can't say that, actually. It's a trademark. No. <laughs> you said it, though, so it's okay. <laughs> hey, Paul, how are you? I'm tired, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. You're going to get your uh, briefing, your Windows Phone briefing next week. It, well, yeah, I'm, what I'm planning to do, and we'll see. Microsoft has apparently done everything they can to screw this up, but I'm going to try to just be there and sit in a room with one of the devices and, and write my book. You know? Oh, you actually sit there and write? Yeah. They let you do that, That's, huh? Well, that's what we're going to find out. Like I said, I mean, I asked him about this back in March, and I was very clear, you know, I can't do this book unless you let me do this. Yeah, 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 no problem, no problem. So, you know, a month and a half later, two months later, last week was the, the absolute latest possible week I could go. And they said, okay, you're good for the week after that. <laughs> you know, so I didn't want to go this week because I, I'm going to be away next week, and I didn't want to have back-to-back -back trips like this. But um, what are you going to do? What so, are you going to do? Going now. So what are you going to do? I'm going to go now. You're going now. Buy my t I buy my ticket at the last minute and pay three times as much as I should have. And I mean, I'll have other meetings while I'm out there, obviously. Yeah. Good. Well, that'll be Whatever, fun. but. How, so you, you, you think you can, well, how many days do you sit there with the phone? I'm hoping for three. So you're not going to really write the book. You're going to like take notes and use it and then, and then go home yeah. and write. Yeah. I mean, I'll do some writing there, but I, yeah, my goal is to. Right, to document every single little screen so that when, oh, as man. I write, I can write. But there are questions I have. I've already written some of the book. And, right. you know, you can only do so much with an emulator or with the videos they put out and so forth. And I'm, uh, I'm curious about how things actually work, you know, when you're connected and so forth. So there's a lot there I need to look into. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I could be there all week. I mean, I wish I, if it wasn't this week, I would have been there for five days. But I can't. I can't be gone that much time. I have to get right. back, get some stuff done, and then leave again. So, What are the top three questions you'd like to have answered by this? About Windows Phone? Yeah, about this visit. The things you don't know that you want to know. That yeah, you're I can't about. really specify them into questions, but they're around uh, such things as, you know, there's this notion of, um, you know, you have an account, typically Windows Live, and when you connect to it, that your feed kind of feeds into all of your, you know, the people hubs and all that stuff. And I want to see what that's like what it's really like with my live data. And it's something you can't do in the emulator. And it's really, I, I think that's where it all comes together. And there are hints of what it must be like if you go to Windows Live right now, they use that what's new feed on their web services and, and the messenger client and so forth. Yeah, but, it's a stream. It's a, it's a live stream. 
Yeah. yeah, and I was actually, I've been playing with that a lot lately for this reason specifically. I connected it to my Facebook account, for example, just to kind of see what that is like. Because from Windows Live, as from the phone, uh, eventually, you can do things like not just see the feed of, of, of stuff coming in off of Facebook, but also post to Facebook if you want from that interface. And then, you know, there's this notion also on the phone of um, not just uh, textual content, but like photos. So if you're in the Pictures Hub, for example, one of the, the pages there is literally photos, of, you know, supplied by your friends and family coming in live over the Internet through Facebook and these other services. I'm really curious to see what that looks like. But again, it, it's just... Um, it's sort of like the final pieces of the puzzle, right? And the most important pieces, really, when you right. think about it. It's hard to do. I mean, it's impossible to do without a device. It's, it's, it's think of it as grout, filling in the cracks. <laughs> that's the grout, yeah. Well, and uh, <laughs> right, but it's also foundational material. I mean, that's the problem. So right. it's not like... Um, Your book is all grout, is that what you're saying? It's all grout, yeah. yeah. It's gritty, uh, certainly. <laughs> um, it's... It's hard because this is the fundamental part of the phone. It's the point of it when you think about it, right? It's this interconnectivity. And that's the one thing we don't see today. So it's cute. You know, we can make our own applications using uh, their developer tools. You know, you can run the emulator and see a very, you know, some very basic bits of it and so forth. That's nice. But, you know, the, the, ver the really basic parts of it, the fundamental parts of it, are just not available yet, right. you know, until you have device. So We shall watch with bated breath. Yeah, I'm curious to see how much they let me talk about what I'm doing out there, too. So I'll, uh, I'll see, <laughs> I guess. Hey, just a note to people who send me emails saying they're doing something with bated breath. Yes. It's B-A-T-E-D, like you're holding your breath. Not, not B-A-I-T-E-D, like you've put worms or fish in your mouth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Difference. Although, it's subtle difference. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> the taste is often the same. <laughs> Yes, it is, isn't it? Often the same. So, uh, guess who is on your side with copy paste? On my side? On, What's who, my side? Who's with you? Who's behind you? Who's standing next to you? Who's Steve Gibson says I was listening oh. to Windows Weekly and it's happened to me too, and I want to know. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. thinks it's a bug too. <laughs> right. So here's the thing. Uh, I don't know what to make of this. I, I liken this to, I don't know if I ever told this story, but my wife and I once saw a UFO. And Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Oh, no, no. Actually, this is one of the most um, well-documented UFO sightings in U.S. history. It happened in Phoenix. Oh, it wasn't just it was, you? Oh, no, it was the entire city. We were out taking golf lessons at night when this happened, but uh, the, everyone there saw it, our instructor, all the people. Um, it was reported on the news every night for three or four days running, maybe a couple of weeks. Um, thousands of people videotaped it, saw it, you know, whatever. Did they ever um, the find classic, out what it was? Well, yeah. So I was very interested within the last year to see, I was clicking through the channels and there was a show about UFOs on and they said Phoenix and I stopped and I said, I wonder, could this be the thing that I saw? And it was. And it was interesting, you know, a decade later to see the U.S. Army or whoever, the, I guess the Air Force come back and say, oh, no, we were testing weather balloons. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah, that's, that's it exactly, that V-shaped thing. So, you saw way, that? I, I saw that. And I uh, like the little wire holding it up at the top of it. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this thing was enormous. I mean, uh, wow. Yeah, no, we and saw the Air it. Force says that's a weather balloon. I don't something like that. Think it was it was so. it was one of those you watch the Roswell things and you think like this couldn't possibly have happened. You know, the the air balloon or the weather balloon story sounds fake, but to hear them say something very similar to that about something I saw personally was difficult because I this was something I, I I mean I witnessed it I don't know what to say I mean it was it was impressive so but the thing is by the way so Governor you, Governor Symington saw it too so I mean you're, oh no I this was yeah this is not like not a group alone. of hillbillies this yeah. the whole city saw it <laughs> a group of hillbillies saw so, it and yeah, Governor so Symington the moonshiners <laughs> saw it one night no no this was uh, well well documented so but here's the thing. That doesn't prove that there's alien life, right? <laughs> I mean, we saw uh, an unidentified object in the sky that was massive and moving in concert and all that kind of stuff. And you can, you can draw certain conclusions about it, but one of the things you can't conclude is alien life exists. You know, I can't, I, you know, it's not clear that this was alien uh, in origin. All we know so, is there's something out there. Yeah, there was certainly something up there in the sky that night. But with regards to copy and paste, 
it's not necessarily a bug in Windows, right? And one of the things I'm sort of coming around to, because I've really been trying to see when this happens, and based on feedback, based on some articles I've seen online, and by the way, I've gotten several hundred emails, and um, thank you, and now stop. <laughs> like I, I mean, I, you know, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, we're all on the same side, uh, enough, you know, enough. I mean, I, I can't answer them all. There's just too many, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, this has happened to I, literally several, several hundred people have emailed me about this. So my belief right now, and Microsoft has gotten back to me, they said they cannot find a, a pattern, is so the way they said it, and uh, that causes this bug in Windows. But I actually wonder now if this is an application specific because of some information that has come uh, to light since you know we started talking about this. Uh, specifically that certain applications, well, all applications, can optionally flush the um, right. the clipboard when they start up and, and even when they get focus. Right. And it's possible, and I guess there are certain applications where this happens a lot, like uh, Excel and Outlook or two that this happens a lot. Um, I, You know, you were just saying uh, something about Chrome, and I use Chrome all the time. And actually, one of the applications that this happens to me uh, with a lot is Chrome. And I have to wonder. Yeah. It might be app specific. Is, if it's not doing something. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, this, but you may recall I, one of the times we talked about this, probably the first time, I guess, um, I was talking about some of the screwy behavior that Windows has always had, you know, for years and years around keyboard shortcuts and how depending on the application you're using, um, you, can hold, you can tap the alt key. And especially in this new generation of Windows applications that don't have menu bars anymore. And by the way, Chrome is a great example of where this happens. Because Chrome has no menu bar. You can't enable it. It just doesn't exist. It's a brand new kind of application. If you're typing in a web form in Chrome and you hit that alt key, you can type for the rest of your life and those letters will never go anywhere. The only way to get out of that is to, you can hit the escape key, you can hit alt again, which kind of toggles the effect. But it's, it's, a, it's a weirdness and it, that is Windows, right? The, that, that the alt key does that is a feature or a side effect, if you will, of Windows. It's just the way Windows works because Windows is expecting another key. It's a, it's a keyboard shortcut kind of a thing. Just like when you hit control C for copy or whatever, alt right. plus something else does things. And it re it has the effect of shutting down keyboard input. Until you say something. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that these things are all interrelated, you know, that the, the underlying silliness, if you will, is just the way that Windows handles the keyboard. And it's, uh, it's anachronistic, it's old-fashioned, it's, you know, based in this kind of DOS uh, past that really no longer applies anymore. And I, I would like to see that overhaul. But, but anyway, I, obviously a lot of people experience this thing. I, there is no solution, per se. But, uh, you know, it is out there. I mean, the truth is out there. The truth <laughs> is out that. there. What's not out there apparently is the things that you're putting into your clipboard. I don't know why, why it happens <laughs> exactly. They're with certain... the other sock that, that disappeared yeah, yeah, from the dryer. Yeah, you're That's right. They're with the socks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're all out there happy together. <laughs> so anyway, it has happened to a lot of um, plus, people. Plus you know. the goldfish that disappeared from my yeah. aquarium when I was six. And the UFO from Phoenix. And, and that... In fact, I believe they are on the UFO. The Flying Carpenter's Square. Just it was, like you, yeah, was, uh, yeah, yeah, I was. long to be mm -hmm. close to you. <laughs> Why do UFOs come down from the sky? All right, we're going to take a break, come back with more. Paul Therat is here. Did you see? Have you gone to Iron Man 2? No, not yet. Uh, but, I haven't either. I want to see it, but I'm told by our chat room that there is a Kin ad right before Iron Man 2. You know, I... I uh, <laughs> you know, we cl we click through the commercials, and every time the Iron Man commercial comes on, I actually stop. So my wife finally said, well, I don't understand why you're stopping on the sad all the time. And I said, Stephanie, it has uh, ACDC music, it has explosions, and it has a superhero in it. I mean, what, Paul. It's, it's like hitting every possible category of things I care about. I, <laughs> you know, it's like, I have it's to like watch. And of course, 15 seconds of pleasure. I mean, why would you deny me this? And you of know? course, Robert Downey Jr. is just gorgeous. Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> yes. Stark <laughs> Industries. Love it. Uh, uh, no, you know, it's funny. I will, because I'll, I'll do the same thing with the DVR. I'll start skipping ads. And then it's really, I think, uh, I, I'm sure they're, by the way, logging all this information. Very yes. interested to see which ones that my kids want me to stop. Oh, wait, let's see that one. 
then I think that that's probably something of great value to the networks. They want to know. What we need to talk about sometime. What? Is, and I've gotten some emails about this lately, but the truth is my wife and I have been looking at this anyway, is the cost of the stuff that we do, you know? And by the stuff that we do, I mean, I think we as Americans especially are taking on more and more of a monthly payment kind oh, of thing as God, time yes. goes on. And the reason this came up in our case, well, we've had a disastrous year financially with, you know, the ad mark and all that. But I mean, we spend a lot of money here as a family on things that sadly would be termed entertainment, you know. And when you look at our Verizon bill in particular, um, it's astonishing how much money we pump into this company. Exactly, every exactly. And one of the things that really shocked me, because I always thought of something like, you know, TiVo, which is excellent, but expensive, right? That you would pay, do you happen to know off the top of your head, what is a TiVo subscription cost per month right now? $15? Oh, I don't know, because, like you know, the, the, I think they still have the $200 lifetime. What chat room will know? What is the what does it cost a month? If you don't I bet buy it's lifetime? somewhere in the twelve to fifteen dollar range. I'm going to guess what that yeah, is. That's yeah. what it is. We pay more than that every month to Verizon for one HD DVR. Really? We actually pay every month for the right to poorly record to a small hard drive right. in a Motorola set top box. Crappy box. Yeah. I think it's seventeen dollars a month. I think that's the charge. Really? On one TV. That's ludicrous. But see, they know because you don't really, it's, you know, you don't pay attention to it, that it's kind of right. invisible. Well, we're, pay, we're paying attention to it. And what's really interesting in, in the case of Verizon, by the way, and a little tip for everybody out there, my wife has done this twice. She's examined the bill and said, we don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this, and we don't need the second phone line and, you know, all this stuff. And she calls them up. And when she's done, the bill is $40 less a month. And we have more HD channels. Right. And we have not lost our second line and, and all this. It's amazing. Like, she's twice lowered our bill dramatically and added to the services that we get. And if you're, you know, I, I would imagine this works in a lot of cable companies. But, you know, Verizon is only part of the story. And, you know, when you look at the smartphone, uh, you know, we have two smartphones. We have a separate uh, phone for one of our kids. You know, the phones, the, I mean, uh, the stuff, it's, it's astonishing how much you can spend. I, maybe sometime this year, I hope to be able to have a conversation about this where I can maybe even outlay, like, this is what I'm spending. You know, this is stupid, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and where do you save money? You know, um, I think if it was just my wife and I, we would probably not pay for TV. I would probably do some kind but of then work. then add into that your Zoom pass or your, right. and your That's iTunes. Yeah, and you add all this stuff just, up. It's, I bet you it's... And this is what gets me about the record and movie industry bitching yeah. about piracy. Mm -hmm. They are making more money off of us every month than ever before, if you ask. I'm pretty sure. Oh, easily. I'm yeah, pretty they sure. Are for me. Despite the fact that I don't physically get in my car, drive to a store and browse DVDs or music or CDs or records or whatever, um, I am definitely spending more. And I think that part of the reason for that isn't, well, I mean, I'm getting older and, and you know, now I make money or whatever, but... It's also the, the convenience of it's it. It's easy. You know, when you're sitting there with your remote control and you yes. have an Apple TV or you have an on-demand thing on your cable box, whatever it is, and, you know, five ninety nine is kind of tough for a rental or whatever the cost is, but I don't have to get off the couch. Right. I mean, face <laughs> it, we're lazy. Yep. People, yeah, screw it. But, you know, it's funny. when you, If you actually pay attention, it's not funny. It's actually the opposite of funny. But when you go and you look at the stuff every month on a month-to-month -month basis, as we've been doing now for three months... It is astonishing and painful to see how much you're spending on this oh, stuff. Yeah. It's crazy. Anyway, we should talk about that at some point. Well, I want to have more. And then more I'm, I'm listening. You know, Ken Alletta wrote an article in the New Yorker and did an interview on Fresh Air last week about the publishing industry, yeah. and how um, they're all worried about eBooks. He says, right. "I think he's nuts because it's going to put bookstores out of business." Now, I love a bookstore. I he, do too. And and I think a bookstore is a wonderful thing, but. Nobody in their right mind is, I mean, it's not going to cost, publish, they're yeah, going to yeah, sell more is, books. This, you're, you're, this is the complaint about, I don't like cars because I like going to the granary yeah. to buy A for my horse. Exactly. And I really value the relationship I have I do with love guy. going to the granary, but. I, come on. Ho horses what, are gone. Things change. Things, things change. change. And I just yeah. thought uh, it actually lowered my, I used to have a lot of respect for Ken Alletta and, I, and his book Googled yeah. and he's written so many great pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think well, he I, didn't I get write it. off of this, but he's a writer. You know, and one of the things you have to be careful of anytime you do anything in life, I guess, is, you know, that you are 
uh, biased by something that affects you directly, you know. Sure, but it, uh, but it should be if any smart writer, it's going to yeah. sell more books. You're going to make more money. They don't have to kill trees. They don't have to ship sure. books around. They don't have the middleman distribution. So yep. oh oh boo hoo, Amazon's making them charge less. But they're <laughs> boo hoo. Uh, yeah. You know, it's all good for everybody. Just and the record industry did the same thing about digital. Sure. Uh, music sure. they went just crazy over it all well, of this i understand similar. it disrupts your you know your your way of thinking but in the long run this is all good for people everybody for consumers for authors and uh, everybody except i'm yeah, sorry like, just to say, as the i'm sure the granary business suffered they're a not doing so good of <laughs> when the car came around <laughs> Um, yeah. If you're a benefits. printer, if you're a truck driver, if you're, uh, you know, uh, the distribution company, and if you're the bookstore, you don't like it. Sure. But Sorry. but I don't think authors or readers should be upset about ebooks. It's good for us. I, one of the things I've been upset about as an author is the sheer time to market that occurs when right. you publish a book in a right. traditional way. It's ridiculous, especially when you write about technology like I do. By the time the book gets in the stores, it's already out of date. Well, you know what the publishers might really be worried about is not the bookstores, but in fact the fact that they're next. Because how long yeah. before authors like you eliminate? What is the publisher doing for you if he's not printing the book, shipping it to a bookstore, getting shelf space? Nothing. You could do it all yourself. You, you could hire an editor and an indexer. Well, right. So what the publisher is doing, I would say, that is actually fairly you do dumb. your own marketing. Yeah. No, but I mean, uh, the one nice thing about traditional book publishing for the most part, is that they do provide an advance. So you get a, a payment ah, that's up true. front, and this yeah. kind of finances you going forward. Now, if you're established... Once you're established, you don't need that. We talked about A-Press and so forth. Yeah. They do things a little differently. Yeah. Um, if you can afford to do this stuff without needing the advance and then reap more benefits on the back end... A lot more. That might work out financially yeah. in the long run. Yeah. yeah. I just think the whole everything's changing. But, but, but I just don't like it when I hear content companies say, oh, we're being ripped off and our profits are going down their profits are going through the roof because digital distribution instant click purchasing invisible bills are making it possible for them to to squeeze more money out of you and me than ever before <laughs> frankly and they and and I think they know that they just don't want us to know it it's yeah. all a big it's all a big lie sure. All right, let's take a break because uh, I want to do commercial and make some more money okay. so I can buy some more crap. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'd like an advance, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, you know, we at first, when we first started paying you and everybody the way we did it, we would wait until mm -hmm. we got the money and then we would pay you. But that took so long. We just now we just send you a monthly check and we kind of sure. advance it because we're in a position now we have enough cash flow. We can do that. Um, but, but don't count on us paying you ahead of time. <laughs> I, I don't count on anything. I don't anything. think we'll get to so. that. I don't think we'll get to the point where we pay you before you do a show. And I would. I would gladly do a podcast tomorrow for some money <laughs> today. Today, <laughs> you know. Oh dear. Let me talk a little bit about uh, my friends at Citrix. Uh, boy, they're doing some great stuff. I was just reading about the new uh, enterprise stuff that they're doing, and um, they they're doing a hypervisor uh, thing. And I just, it's really a great company. And what's what's nice is this high-end enterprise technology trickles down to the consumer stuff. It allows them to make great new products and all sorts of innovative stuff. We've talked about go to my PC before, go to meeting, uh, uh, the new go to training, and go to Assist Express. Not new. Go to Assist has been around for a while. I was using it on the screensavers to help people, uh, but go to Assist Express is new and fast and fantastic. Recently named the worldwide market leader in remote support by Frost and Sullivan. They focus on this sector. Uh, it's the number one remote solution, remote support solution worldwide because it's easy to use, it's affordable, it's secure. You don't have to pre-install software in your customers' machines. You just say, I'll fly out, put something on your machine, and come back, or tell them how to do it. You just send them a link. They click it, and you're in. Whenever your customers have a problem, you can instantly start supporting them online. You can do up to eight sessions at once. You can drag files from your computer to theirs if you've got to fix a, a, an update uh, and install. Um... You can find out what operating system they're running, what security software, everything running in the background. Mac and PC, by the way. They've got day passes for those of you who do this occasionally. Of course, month to month for those who do it all the time. 128-bit encryption, free 24-7 customer service. All in all, this is a great solution for anybody in the support business. I want you to call. Actually, do it on the web. You're, 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 you're probably web savvy by now. Go to <laughs> www.gotoassist.com slash windows. 
Go to assist.com slash windows. Sign up for 30 days absolutely free. 30-day trial. It's on us. Give it a shot. I think you'll find it's the best way. Frost and Sullivan were right to support remotely. Go to assist.com slash windows. We thank them for their support of uh, the Windows Weekly Show. Uh, you know, it's funny because we've been talking about Office 2010 for some time. And but yep. now I saw it this week in the papers. Office 2010 is out. What what happened? I don't understand. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. What? Yesterday was a, there was a launch event in New York. That oh, I, uh, they had the party. Attended. Yeah. You went? It was nice. Actually, it was at the NBC studios where they filmed uh, where they film Saturday Night Live. So. Oh, that's cool. It was actually on that set. It was kind of cool. And um, wow, you know, that's these, really neat. Yeah, that was probably the only fun part of <laughs> the event. I mean, you know, it's. It's an office launch or whatever, but um, yeah, it's nice. I mean, so these things are broadly available for businesses. Now, the consumer launch is June 15th, and Microsoft has finally owned up to that date, which you and I, of course, have been talking about for months. But on June 15th, you'll be able to get, uh, as an individual office, in a retail box, you know, in a, in a store. You can download it from the web. You can get it with a new PC. And if you want to try out those office web apps, those free versions of certain office applications that run on the web, you can do that also on June 15th. But if you want to get the, uh, the mobile version, that's actually available now for free, but you have to have a Windows Mobile 6.5 phone. So the, uh, the six of you guys out there that <laughs> qualify for that, please, uh, you know. So what does fun. mobile office look like on a, uh, what is, uh, what, how does that look on 6.5? Does it look, I mean, yeah, it looks that? the same. I mean, the, the 6.5 deal is just that it supports multi-touch and gesture support for, you know, scrolling around documents and so forth. Okay. But it's basically, it's basically very similar to what it's always looked like. I think the big deal this time around is that um, OneNote is more integrated now into the suite. It's you know not a separate install. And then there's a SharePoint app that allows you to access uh, documents that are hosted up in a SharePoint server from the phone, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, especially you know again mostly in a, in a work environment. But if you have all of your documents up on the web or in the in the SharePoint server, you can access them over the air from the device. And uh, that's something I actually have tested. That works pretty well. So that's pretty cool. But it's free. So um, for Windows Mobile 6.5 devices that have multi-touch and have a previous version of Office, um, this version is actually free. So that's the first time they've ever done that. And that's, that's pretty good. Neat. Yeah. Office 2010. And uh, Google Docs rolls over and goes away. <laughs> no, it doesn't go away, but... You know, we talked about this a little bit, I think, on that uh, This Week in Google podcast and so forth. And I, there's sort of a disconnect, I think, between perception and reality when it comes to things like uh, the success of Google Docs versus Office and so forth. So there's been some interesting data that's come out in the past uh, 30 days or so, and, and some of it is here in the notes. But, you know, um, Office Smart, actually, I guess it's used to share, has remained completely unchanged for three years running now. It's at 94% of the market. Um, that's the time frame in which Google Docs and, of course, Google Apps have been around. And it suggests that they have not impacted office usage at all. But the other interesting bit of data is that Google, about 30 days ago, said that they have 25 million people using Google Apps accounts. And uh, they refused to discuss, you know, how many of them are paying. But I think we all know that the vast majority of those people are not paying. The, you know, they're getting the free version. Really? I mean, uh, I think a lot of businesses and, and, and st <clears throat> stuff are using it, though, aren't they? Maybe not. Well, I, yeah, but I think even in that case... For free, they're, they're, they're using it? They're, they're mostly using it. They're not buying sure. the domain thing? We were going to do that. It's like $40 yeah, yeah. a year per It's user. not that expensive, but, yeah. I, the, you know, again, this is one of those things I think if, if Google had a good story to tell here, they would... They would they tell would it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying the lack of news Yeah, is yeah. Bad now, news. something that's been a lot, around a lot less time than this is Microsoft's hosted versions of their Exchange, SharePoint, and other servers, right? Microsoft Online Services... They've announced in the past 30 days that they have over 40 million customers using those services. But every single one of those guys pays for this. There is no free version of Microsoft Online Services. So they're getting between $5 and $15 a month per customer for every single one of those 40 million people. So it, it's kind of interesting to me that on the, uh, I would say, the hosted email side of it, um, Microsoft certainly has more, pay, you know, well, they have more customers overall um, uh, than Google Apps does, but they're all paying. Whereas... You know, most of Google's customers are not paying. So it's, that's kind of interesting. And I think we had talked previously about how uh, somewhere between 60 and 70% of existing 
office users are still in office 2003 i mean that that clearly is really the biggest competitor that office 2010 has right this installed base of people who aren't necessarily inclined um to move ahead to a new version i wonder how many know? people are using both you know it may not both. impact sales because they're using google docs and still buying office at least for now you think that's in other words well, do you think there's a problem yeah, on the so horizon th those two those two numbers aren't directly comparable from an office standpoint so Google Apps includes the, the Gmail and calendar stuff as ah, well as okay. Google Docs and so forth. Microsoft Online Services is only the email document sharing, that kind of stuff. So um, Microsoft now, as of today, offers a free version of their Office web apps You know that anybody can access starting on June 15th, but today businesses can access. Um, that is essentially a direct competitor to Google Docs specifically, right? And it is a free alternative. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's marketing hoo-ha in a way, but there is some truth to it. You know, in a sort of implicit um, response to this notion of, you know, Google's in the cloud and you're not kind of thing, Microsoft said yesterday that with Office 2010, you know, you could have the cloud on your terms, which is actually, it's cute, but it actually makes some sense, right? That... Microsoft offers these office productivity solutions across a kind of a wide range of capabilities. You can have them on your PC. You can get a, essentially a free version of Office bundled with a PC now, which is new to 2010. You can get the free Office web apps. You can get it on your phone as actual applications that run offline. Um, and you can get them in the cloud. You can get them in the, your business through SharePoint. And, of course, you can get the traditional Office applications that have been around for a long, long time. A lot of options there, you know. Some of them are free. Some of them are very inexpensive. And some of them you actually do just you need to pay for. It. Um, you know, Google has Google Docs, and it's you know it is what it is. I think it's um, it's probably okay, you know, for a lot of people. But I, I think that the I guess I th I just think that you know it's interesting. Even if you when you look at the headlines of the articles that were written about the Office launch this week, almost nine out of ten of them mentioned used Google. The, well, talked about Google or yeah. talked about the online yeah. aspect of it and how, you know, Microsoft shoots for Google's market or, you know, Microsoft finally has a competitor to Google. <laughs> As if and it's Google like, was the it, dominant yeah, player. Like, really? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, and we talked about this before. I, I feel very strongly that cloud computing is the future. But this is just one of those areas where for whatever, you know, for many reasons probably, uh, this very traditional software that not so long ago was delivered on a floppy disk right. is still just Huge. so dominant. You know? I think that, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, guilty of this uh, as much as anyone, if, if not more. Um, we tend to live in a bubble. I tend to live in a bubble where I look sure. at what's the future, what people are moving to, what's exciting and different. And so stuff that's stayed and has been around for a while and just kind of keeps cranking it out, like Office, is not so interesting and so but do you think that i mean obviously most people still use windows in some cases xp and office in some cases 2003 yep. that's you know that's the, the norm trend? but what's the trend you think that microsoft is threatened by these other absolutely i mean they wouldn't be doing this otherwise right uh there's an opportunity in the cloud i i, I think that the the threat is in the future and it involves people who are growing up now with very different experiences with computers and online services and so forth than the experiences we had, you know, 10 years ago, right? It's a different world. And for those people, for some of them, for many of them, I think, you know, Microsoft Office maybe isn't something they consider, you know? And that's the fear. You know, you want to, uh, you want people to have this experience early in life and then straight through, right? I mean, you don't want them, because when they get out of school, if they've been using Google stuff the whole time, they're going to expect that when they get to work, you know. And I think one of the big advantages of the Microsoft stuff has been, you know, they get into education, they get into higher education. People get used to these tools. Now they want them when they get to work, and they do get them when they get to work, you know. If that changes, that could change the, uh, the dynamic dramatically because one of the biggest trends in enterprise computing is, you know, sort of the uh, consumerization of IT, right? that they've basically given up. You know, there was a time frame there where, where IT, just as a rule, was fighting against things like iPods and USB keys and portable hard drives and all these things that people just sort of take for granted. 
And now there's just an understanding like, look, they're going to do this, so we need to deal with it. And, um, you know, you want to you wanna reach that generation of people that are coming up, and you want to be part of their lives yeah. early on, because if you're not, you never will be. We have an, we're in an interesting situation now where you've got, the guy in the corner office may not even be using a computer. <laughs> sure. The middle sure. managers are using, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that was they learned about in the '90s and the and the 2000s. Right. Right. And then the twenty-somethings coming out of college are saying, "Well, I, I don't understand. I use Gmail and Google Docs. Well, you're going to make me do yeah, what? Yeah. yeah, I use Docs on Facebook. Yeah, Can I don't I understand. Yeah, what is yeah. it? You, you want me to do that's, what? I mean, and that's something you got to be. You know, they have to be careful about. You know, Microsoft has a pretty good. Um, penetration into the education market, actually. I think both Google and Microsoft are probably on pretty equal footing with their, you know, we will provide your email hosting stuff for free. You can have it through your EDU account. You know, you're basically accessing what looks like uh, your school's email system, but it's really Microsoft or Google on the back end. I bet those two things are very comparable. Um, but again, you know, that's, they have to be there. And, and, they, they have these programs now where you can get office very, very cheaply as a student. Um, and everyone who is a student should take advantage of those deals. But it's smart for Microsoft to do that because, again, you want to get them hooked on this stuff when they can't afford to pay for stuff. You right. know, because hopefully when they can't afford, um, they'll be paying for your stuff. Everybody does that. I mean, I, I think Apple pioneered this with putting Mac, not even Macs, Apple IIs in schools way back when. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, my kid's kindergarten had Apple twos still in the back of the kindergarten where they were doing, you know, green screen yeah. educational software because by making sure. a Commodore. <laughs> they put <laughs> them in the schools that. because yeah. uh, then you have, and, and, and you grew up with this kind of bonding. It's like baby ducks. Yeah. The first computer you saw. Uh, so it's it, smart, but I think they're realizing you do it in grade school is not so smart because by the time they're in the workforce, you know, uh, get get them while they're young is not the the, the title you want to see on the slide. Yeah, right. <laughs> Describing this strategy. works for cigarettes, but maybe not for computers. Yeah. On the other hand, get them in college is probably very smart because those kids are going to be in the workforce in a few years, and that will drive slowly bottom up, but it will drive yeah. uh, workforce policy. I, I think in, for this generation of software, uh, and by this, I mean Office twenty ten. Um, Status quo is going to be maintained, but you know Microsoft now has an inroad into this uh, cloud computing market with Office web apps, and I think it's the next version where it's going to get really interesting along those lines. Because I think I said this on the podcast last week. I feel like Microsoft has purposefully downplayed and uh, even limited, artificially limited that online software, so as not to cut into their um, you know classic market because it's still so strong. But I, I think they're I think they're holding back with the notion that if we ever do see a dip, we can you know turn on the funnel and we'll have all this other functionality. You're I, I really I, I think they're moving to full you know office on the web, you know, and that will be the future. Yeah. Why not? I mean, yeah. That's you know, and 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 now well, here's a question: Silverlight, yeah. right? Or will it be HTML5? Oh right. So that that's I don't important know. too, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I. I I could sort of see a, uh, a situation where there were different levels of functionality based along what your browser had. So the Silverlight version would be better. It does introduce the interesting possibility of Microsoft not having to specifically support the Mac with its own version and Windows with its own version, right? You just create a version that runs in the cloud. And suddenly, if you're running on Linux, it just works. Um, you still have to deal with all those browser differences. But when you look at what Microsoft's doing around the same markup thing, you think, well, that's interesting. What if all the web browsers do render the same markup identically? Then when they create mm -hmm. Office on the web and other mm -hmm. things on the web. It's in their interest. It is in their interest. And they have just one platform they have to support. Right. Um, Sta genius. Oh, my God. Standards-based computing in Microsoft's interest. Amazing. Well, but it is. But right? that's, well, they've created the first standard. They created Windows. Sure. That was the standard. They created DOS. That was the standard. They're no yeah. strangers to that. They understand the power of having a standard platform well they're just interested <laughs> they are strangers to working with standards bodies well they're <laughs> they're strangers to open standards because they don't yeah, make any money on that standard yeah but i think that they're going to realize look this is where sure. where it's headed and if we want to continue you know it there are some powerful benefits to having a a, a web standard that we can des develop you know design our office to work with Right. I love that. To me, that's the holy grail. Where, and I think it's what we've talked about for years, where we don't even think about operating system. I don't know. I just have a browser. 
Yeah. I don't even know what you're talking about. What operating system is it running? Just as we no longer, probably most, many, not all, care about what processor, how much RAM, what hard drive, that's all moot. It has, becomes a different level of, of abstraction exactly. at some point, right? Yeah. And uh, that's what you want. I mean, yeah, geeks who love yeah. the, you know, we love talking about speeds and feeds, but most people don't care, don't want to care. Sure. I mean, imagine, you know, 20 years ago, there were a lot of very similar looking boxes that were completely incompatible. Um, you know, you oh, couldn't yeah. tell by looking at it whether the software you had would work on such a machine. Sure, right. You know, eventually, I think these distinctions need to disappear. So. And, and, well, that's, and that's what the Internet is, could potentially be about, unless Facebook takes it all over. And then, of course, maybe that's Facebook's plan. All it has to do is work with Facebook. They've even invented... If we could just get Microsoft to give us a free version of Office, uh, that would be the first step. Well, docs.com. That would be the first step. Docs.com. And, and you know, uh, Facebook even invented its own markup language. They don't even use standard web markup. They use I F hope it's F called FTML. Please F tell me it's FBML. Close enough. Oh, F Facebook yeah. markup language. That's how, that's how against open they are. They want to own it. Yeah. You know, I, I actually was... I just looking at CNN. They wrote a story about me. I deleted my Facebook page yesterday, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess I'm a trend. It's weird <laughs> because I just friended you two days ago. Yeah, so sorry. That, Up you. Yeah. That was you were the last straw. You were yeah. <laughs> off the rods here. I'm out of here. <laughs> this neighborhood's going I'm to hell. It's rest. like AOL was for a while. You know, AOL for a while was the thing. CompuServe was, was no. I was never an AOL. I was a CompuServe guy though. It's like a Beavis and Butthead episode, you know. Winger yeah. was never cool, Butthead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Earth. Oh, Earth. dear. Oh, dear. Hey, a big, big milestone. Intel uh, making an announcement. We're going to talk about that in just a second. You're listening to Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat, editor-in-chief of the Super Site for Windows at winsupersite.com. I want to tell you about our friends at Drobo. We are we are a Drobo house now. Let me tell you, I have the, I've always had a Drobo at home for my uh, my home backup. That was the original Drobo, and it has you know four disk bays, so that means you can. And by the way, you can mix and match. You put any drives you got. That's what I liked. I had I always have lots of old you know. <laughs> for a while, when you know it was a 160 gig drive, what am I going to do with that? Then it was a 500 gig drive. What am I going to do with that? <laughs> it was a terabyte drive. What am I going to do with that? <laughs> They're getting bigger and bigger. You stick them in the Drobo, it adds up. The Drobo has four drives. It takes one of them for redundancy, so you never can lose data. Even if one of the drives dies, you just pop it out, put a new one in, and your data is intact. Great for a photo collection, family videos for backup. That's what I use. I use it for a time machine. Then there, there, there came the Nubo Dro newer Drobo, Nubo Drobo S with five disk bays. Made it even faster. Drobo Pro, eight disk bays. Imagine now you could put two terabyte, eight two terabyte drives in there, get 16 terabytes of redundant storage. The Drobo Elite has eight disk bays, but it's a storage area network, it means that you can have 16 connections to it. There are uh, dual gigabit Ethernet ports on it, connecting via iSCSI. So that means very high speed Ethernet based connectivity. It looks like a local drive. To all of those 16, it's not a networked drive. It looks like a local drive to all those 16 uh, units. It's pretty amazing. And if you've ever purchased a SAN, you know it's a lot more affordable. In fact, we have to buy, not only do we have to buy the SAN for $20,000, but then each desk is another $1,000 for the software. I mean, this is crazy. That, not with a Drobo. It's very affordable. I'll give you an example. Uh, you want to really load up a, uh, a Drobo Elite with eight two-terabyte drives, Normally five thousand ninety nine dollars will save you five hundred bucks, and I'll tell you how in a second. Forty five ninety nine. That's sixteen terabytes. Our SAN twenty thousand dollars. Do the math plus a thousand a seat. Do the math. The new Drobo FS. We're using that for backup too. So I have a Drobo FS here, a Drobo FS at home. We back up the Drobo FS here, and then it automatically over the internet mirrors itself to my home drive. For off-site backup, I mean, Drobo is a great solution it's for small, medium, and large. You take a look at all of the Drobo has to offer at drobo.com slash windows. That's where you get $25 to $500 off a new Drobo. Drobo.com slash windows. We love Drobo. Put all of your stuff on a Drobo. Drobo.com slash windows. Did you say Nubo Drobo? I, did. <laughs> I don't. I have not heard of that model. It's the Nubo Drobo. <laughs> it's the Nubo Drobo Lango Lango. Um, 
It's like one of those kids' languages, you know, they make up where they enter, it puts syllables in the middle of things and Sure. Yeah. Just they do they do it to leave me out. <laughs> I've always just, done it to leave me out. I just do it because I trip over words. That's that's why I did it. Nubo Drobo. So this is a huge milestone and it does put uh, the iPad sales into perspective. Intel. Yeah. Did you see this? It was I um, didn't. I this, love this. Intel has an investors uh, you know, meeting every year and, and the CEO, Paul Otellini, said that the PC industry has crossed this milestone where they are now selling over one million computers every single day. Wow. Every single day. That's just and, stunning. Um, and it's funny because he never said the word iPad, but he very clearly meant the iPad because he, he said that sales of tablet computers were, by comparison, insignificant. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that was a little bit of a, a, a oh, snub yeah. of Apple in a way because, of course, oh, Apple's yeah. using their own microprocessor in the, uh, in the oh, iPad yeah. and not an Intel processor, which is kind of interesting. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's a huge number. It, it's it's it, it's funny it never occurred to me that we were getting there because, of course, they sell over 300 million computers a, a year. And you can kind of do the math and figure out how many would it, you know, if they sold a million a day, how many would that be in a year? But, um, yeah, you know, it that's a, <laughs> it's a big it's a big market. You know, it's it's really interesting. Wow. A million PCs a day. That's worldwide, obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's Intel PCs. That's, is that not including AMD or any other processor? No, I, I assume that means AMD as well. I think this it's is the market. All computers. Got yeah, it. the computer market. Wow, that's that's just kind of a mind boggle. And of course, yeah, what percentage of those you think are running Microsoft Windows? Much much more than half, seventy five maybe. Um, <laughs> I think it's more like ninety five. Ninety five. Well, I yeah. mean, there's got to be. I mean, if you're including. Well, maybe yeah, I guess it does all probably all comes with Windows, right? Yeah, most of them. Almost sure. all. That's a, that's I mean, that's the other side of that number. That's yeah. That's a lot of copies of Windows. Yeah. And Jeez. you know, it, it kind of ties into that whole, you know, the netbook um uh, ultra low cost computer, you know, iPad, you know, equation, whatever. But, you know, he uh, again, I think be, because of the kind of crazy stories that have been written about the iPad lately, you know, he he had these kind of little jabs at this uh you know, conversation that's been going on, but he said, you know, like office, I guess it's, it's, it's old, it's boring, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. But he said, you know, the PC industry is actually a growth market. You know, uh, this is something that's going up. It's not leveling off. Oh, it's not boy. plateauing. Yeah. It's, it's we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, you know, well, it that, is a big deal. That's, and that's interesting. That responds to my, my thought that this might be a post PC world we're living in. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I think that for the foreseeable future, there will be a need for these kind of general purpose computers. I mean, they just will. But I, I think that smartphones and uh, these tablet devices like the iPad and so forth, uh, at least they appear to be additive, right? That people are buying these things in tandem with computers, not replacing computers, you know? Um, th I think there's always going to be a, some portion of the population that could get away with just using one of these lower end devices, I suppose. Um, but the, I think it's just the sheer utility of the PC. I mean, it's, it's interesting how it has kind of bucked these trends, you know, computers are being added into everything, you know, and, and I don't just mean computers like uh, little microprocessors, obviously, you know, your TV set has chips in it of some kind or whatever, and, and memory and, and whatever else. I mean, yeah, it doesn't mean it's a, a personal computer, but, you know, you're starting to see TVs that have, you know, internet connectivity, you know, Yahoo widgets and interaction with uh, back-end computers and the ability to display digital media content and so forth. You know, these things are becoming more and more powerful as well. And other devices, cars, of course, you know, with the Ford Sync type systems and all that. It doesn't mean you're going to sit in your car and dictate a word processing document. Right? I mean, it's, uh, you may, but in fact, I've often dreamt of doing just that. But, um, you know, it's interesting I, it, that, these general purpose computers really have just kind of kept kicking along. And I, you know, who knows what the future is going to bring, but at least for the foreseeable future, it seems like this is a still, still a pretty healthy market. Yeah. I mean, it, I guess it does depend on the, what they call what they call a PC, but I, I mean, yeah, we know what a PC is. I, I don't think they yeah. would. Yeah. I mean, a netbook's a PC, obviously. Sure. I mean, you could, and people, I, I know people must do this, but you could sit in your den with a wireless keyboard and, 
type on your big HD T display, I guess. People you know, do it. Absolutely, people could do, do it. it. Yeah. It's not the way I would want to write anything meaningful, but um, yeah. could do it. All right, we are uh, we are ready to move to the portion of the show in which we boggle your mind. Oh no, not yet. One more thing, and then we'll boggle your mind with the Windows Seven. Actually, there's two more things because you forgot the top story. I forgot the top story. Yes. I did forget the top story. Well, let's save that. First, Android outsells iPhones in the U.S. Now, you're big on, on debunking th mm -hmm. precisely these kinds of announcements. Right. Do you have anything to say about this? This NPD group well, said this. Yeah, well, here's the thing. And, and NPD is a, an organization I actually uh, investigated a little bit a few years ago. And uh, what I found out was... They're really reliable. Oh, <laughs> and, good. All right. In fact, uh, it was Microsoft who came back to me. In fact, I want to say it was around the time of the first generation Zune. They had come up with some kind of market share numbers around the Zune or whatever. And uh, I questioned this. And um, what I actually heard back from Microsoft was, uh, we use these guys. Everyone uses these guys internally. They are who we trust. So if you're looking for how things are really selling in the United States in particular... Uh, consumer electronics, computers, and so forth. MPD is it. They're rock solid. Yeah. So I, I don't actually question MPD anymore. If I see something from MPD, I, I tend to disbelieve well, it. Well, Apple questioned it. <laughs> they did. And, and that's... But they really didn't really even question it. They just kind of spun it. Yeah. You know, it, that's, what's, that's almost the only reason I mentioned this. Um, you know, Apple has a way of not responding to right. anything. You better, know? better not to, uh, frankly. Yeah, because they tend to take things internally. You know, when people criticize their products, they don't usually come out and say, screw you, you're wrong. They usually just kind of work on it. And then the next version comes out and some of those problems are addressed. You right. know, that's typically right. the way they do things. Um, so did you see this? I mean, Apple actually yeah. kind of responded to these guys. They and, said, well, uh, worldwide, we still outsell Android. Yeah, we're still yeah, we're still beating the worldwide, yeah. you know, which is like another conversation entirely. You know, that's not what they said. It was, you know. Um, the other thing that's worth noting here, and I think this is important, is that, you know, Android, of course, uh, is not a device like Apple's iPhone is. And it's not sold by one company. I think that's a lot of the that. secret of success is there's four or five oh, that's really good handsets. Almost all of it, yeah. yeah. So, um, And now, by and, the way, Google's doing deals like to put Android in cars. GM says we're going to do an Android car system. Yeah. Android's, yeah. Android's about to explode. There, uh, Google says, yeah. and, H, and other companies say, not, not HP, but other companies say they're going to do Google... Uh, Android-based tablets. Right, right. It's a good operating system. It's Linux. Sure. <sighs> I hate to see something like Linux become popular, but I see what you're saying. <laughs> I'm going to drive you crazy. <laughs> oh, stupid. I'm crazy. loving I just put Ubuntu on my uh, on my Samsung NC20 netbook. Mm. The you know, new, I have to say, the new Ubuntu. Link, it's uh, good. 10.4 10, 10, or 10, whatever. 10.04, yeah. Um, it looks nice. It's good. Looks nice. I mean, it should. They, they copy Microsoft and just about everything. Maybe. But, you know, it's it's nice. You know, it's nice. You know, it's, it's surprising. It's the first time I can remember installing on a, on a laptop. Well, traditionally difficult because laptop, non-standard hardware yeah. and laptops and so forth yeah. and weird configurations. Didn't have to hand in it, ed, edit any of those uh, Nothing. configuration files. Everything you know, worked. The camera worked. The Bluetooth worked. The Wi-Fi worked. It recognized everything. It worked just, it looked just like worked just like Windows when you install Windows on something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was stunned. That's a lot, that's a lot of work no, it's to come, do. It's come a long ways. Yeah. I mean, I, listen, I've sweated over these little, you know, why oh. can't the uh, exact display resolution of my yes. computer work on the, oh. you know, that kind of thing. I mean, that for years. Linux used to be a disaster for that kind of stuff. Um, and anything esoteric, um, you know, I have a, uh, a D-Link wireless router and I can't, you know, yeah, sorry. I mean, yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, that stuff just kind of works now. I have yet to have a, any hardware issues and, um, and mm -hmm. the, also the software uh, has become more mature. You know, it comes with Firefox. I'm kind of off Firefox these days. Yeah, Love Chrome. Well, there's Chrome, and the Chrome extensions work, and uh, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty much yep. doing everything. I, because Chrome syncs bookmarks with Google now, I'm, like, up and running. I know. And I, I, really using la I use LastPass for my passwords. It works on Linux and Chrome. I'm up and running. Crazy. Crazy. It's amazing. Who'd have thunk it? How about Office 2010? How's that running on Not there? well. <laughs> Comes with this free thing <laughs> called OpenOffice. I'm sure I the see, penetration yeah. of OpenOffice is tiny. But it comes with Open Office. You know, the sure. truth is, I I've used Open Office, but really, it's okay. It's, it's okay. okay. I use Google Docs if I if I yep. uh, most of the time on a netbook. Anyway, this only has sixty. I put a sixty gig solid state drive in this, so this doesn't have mm -hmm. a lot of space. Um, but yeah, that's but that why probably makes a big difference performance wise. Oh, it does. You know? 
Yeah. Oh, it's it's a snappy little pucker. Yeah. Okay, the big story, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, the and big. You, you have no idea what I mean by this, do you? The All I know story. is what the headline is: cessations have ceased. All I can think is you've given up playing that stupid. I mean, uh, that whoa, whoa, whoa. that fun game. You're not playing anymore. What's I think the a deal? better way to say it, Leo, and I, and this is how I would phrase it: you beat is, it. I have beaten it. <laughs> you beat it. I have mastered it. There is nothing more for me to do. You, what you mean? But wait a minute. I have achieved thought... the tenth stage of enlightenment, or as Call of Duty calls it, uh, tenth prestige. Wow, that is pretty. It, it, that is it pretty literally good. does not allow me to level up anymore. That's damn impressive. I've gone to level seventy twice. Wow. Uh, I'm sorry, ten times. Ten times, and now it's done. Damn. And you know what's interesting is by doing this ten times, and I did the same thing in the previous game too. And I have to give them credit because Treyarch, uh, the guys who made uh, World at War, the previous game, uh, there was a little. I don't know if it was a challenge or an. I think it was an achievement, and it was worth zero points, but it was the final achievement. And when you got it, you know, it, it brings up the achievement sound and it says, seriously, go outside and see the sun. You know, like a does it? Oh, that's funny. And then in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, unfortunately, they, it just does nothing. You literally hit the whatever the points are you need to get to that point. And then it's just, you just you can keep playing. You can play forever, but it just it stops, you know, letting you level that's up. It. Yeah. But now. OK, forgive a noob question. Yes. But it is the online play that you care most about, isn't it? That's what I finished. That's what I'm saying. In other words, I could keep playing online. I could keep you playing. You mean there's no one worth beating anymore? But there's no point because I can't level up ever again. Oh, so that's I, why I have, you play is to get I've level. I've achieved the... So, I have all the guns. I have all the... Don't you like want to like get the awe and envy of people when you walk into a room and they go, oh, Shh, there's Paul Thorat, 10th level ninja. <laughs> well, no, no because... There's nowhere to go but down now because now if oh, somebody beats me, then you lose. You know, it, this is a huge achievement for them, and for me, it's kind of a you know, what what am I doing here again? So I get it. You're like Bobby Fischer. You're giving up chess. This is it. You've uh, you've done everything you could ever want to do, and and that Boris Spassky guy, he can just go suck eggs. Yes. Did you get all so. the in-game achievements? Yep. There's nothing you could. You are tenth prestige. There's nothing you could do. Well, I, I could keep going. I mean, this this kind of esoteric uh, challenges related to uh, headshots with weird guns that I right. would never use. I guess you I, must you do know. a headshot with the bazooka. It's a lot of work for nothing. I yeah, mean, I, I you know, I got stuff to do. Hey, you know, I know, I you know what I know. I exactly know how you feel because I have done the same thing with Plants vs Zombies. So I, you know, <laughs> I, gonna, I have done the same thing, but with real life. <laughs> In real life, I've achieved all that I would like to achieve. <laughs> In fact, I actually got the. Achievement unlocked symbol the other day in the <laughs> in the store over, in the grocery in, store in, in, over my head. Achievement unlocked level that seventy. Yeah. So, well, that's true. In life, when we've accomplished everything, we just that now enjoy the the, the fruits rewards. of our rewards. You not not in Call of Duty apparently. No, there's no rewards. I'm gonna have to do something else. I love it. Might this. be it might be bad company too. Why don't you come out here? We're doing laser tag on Memorial Day. Oh my God! We, like you I have to, you have to run. You get oh, I've sweaty. Done, I've, done I've done paintball. Paintball is awesome. Paintballs. This is not. This is this is paintball for wimps who don't want to get hurt. Yeah, you haven't lived until someone's pumped Fuck. full of paint. You know? Yeah, no, the, the laser doesn't hurt, <laughs> but it's fun. I mean, it's the same idea. You're running around. You're yeah. dodging between trees and stuff. And there's different kinds of uh, uh, guns. I think there's three different kinds of guns. We really enjoy doing this. We I feel can't say from experience that Call of Duty, you know, pays off. For that kind of thing, like you actually do develop survival skills, you know that makes sense. Well, at least you get your yeah. heart beating in this. Yeah, yeah. Look, sure. I got my uh, I got my draft noticed. Really? This is yeah. Ordered a report for induction oh, from nice. the president of the United States. Hereby order for induction into the dot com wars capture the flag laser tag picnic <laughs> party at Memorial Park awesome. Work Campsite Number One, Loma Mar, California, Monday, May thirty first, one p.m. So I'm I I don't have a choice. Right. I agree. Yeah, I have to go. SFLaserTag.org. If you're in the Bay Area and you want to play with us on Memorial Day, I want to field... I don't want to field a twit company. I don't want to field a twit battalion. I want to field a twit fracking army. I want I like a thousand it. soldiers in the field. Sure. <laughs> I wish what I could. <laughs> there aren't enough guns. We can't. <laughs> I would love to have you come out. Well, if you're uh, on the way home from uh, Redmond, if you can do that. 
Well, uh, no, I mean, I'm going to be away. May 31st. Somewhere else. Yeah, you'll be in, you'll be in, are you going to Holland, France? Where are you going? Uh, Portugal. You've discovered Portugal. Mm-hmm. And now life will never be the same, will it? I know. I'm hoping that they fail economically because then I can afford to buy a place. Well, you can go to I Greece I can't afford now. to buy anything right now. But. You, could buy a, uh, you could buy a mansion in Greece for like $12. Yeah, I can afford that. And that's close. It's not that close. Portugal. What is, I've heard so many good things about Portugal. I love Portugal. What is it about Portugal? You just discovered it, right? You, you went there for the first yeah. time last year. Last year, yeah. What, what is it? What is it about Portugal? Yes, what is it? Um, you know, I one of the things I really like about Paris, of course, is just the kind of general vibe, you know, the coffee shops and the look of right. the place and all that kind of stuff. Right. But Paris is a big tourist destination and it's really crowded um, in tourist seasons. Um, so I've always wondered if there were cities in France like Lyon or somewhere else where you could get that kind of Paris experience but without the tourists, right. you know. And Lisbon is sort of like that. It's a much smaller city. Um, it's on the water, which is really nice, but it's got that kind of nice city vibe to it. And it's, uh, it's not expensive. That's why we went last year. It was, yeah, I've heard it's very affordable. It was the two choices we had that were very, you know, inexpensive for Europe, uh, Lisbon and Berlin, you know, in the winter. I mean, Lisbon was kind <laughs> no, of a Do non. not go to Berlin in the winter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> do not. Uh, there's yeah, no, so it's there's no black our, leather jacket heavy enough for Berlin. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So this year is our 20th anniversary. Oh, and really? That's where, that's where we're going for your 20th our, since you got married. Yeah. Good lord, you were kids when you got married. Jennifer and our my 20th is next year, and I'm like twice as old as you. At least, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and twice as heavy, apparently. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Wow, that's uh, that's, a, that's great. 20th and what a wonderful thing. Well, a happy anniversary and enjoy uh, Lisbon. You know, I hear Buenos Aires is like well, amazing. Actually, so that's one of the other ones. And the problem with Buenos Aires is, and, and it's cheap, um, it's really hard to get to. And it's a huge flight. Um, oh, yeah. From Boston to Buenos Aires is anywhere from 18, 20 hours, somewhere in that time frame. And it's just a. I'm going. A brutal, I'm going in February. That's why I mentioned that. I, I want to go badly, and I I would just say that this is going to be make no sense to people from the West Coast, but from Boston, and it may be the only place in the United States this is possible. Maybe New York too. I guess you can go to Europe, you can go to Europe for a long weekend from here. Right, and that's uh, right. That's a good it point. Sounds, it's just, it's just it sounds a, crazy, it's, it's but you really the can't pond. do it. And there are even some flights. We've only done this, I think, twice, but uh, British Air does this. Um, some cities you can actually fly not overnight, but just that day. And that actually really helps on the whole clock and you right. know, getting on the schedule. So if you want to go to London, you could leave in the morning and arrive there. It's very late at night, I right. think, if I remember how the, <laughs> the clock works or whatever. But it's the same day is, is how it works. Right. And you can actually fly the same day. That's kind of interesting. So we're not doing that for Lisbon, but it's, um, it is a possibility. So. Of course, you know, this uh, volcano could erupt, in which case we'll be... Um, You'll be stuck. Be in our backyard. Which ain't so bad. Well, maybe it'll erupt after you get there. Then that we'll would be, be doing fantastic. Windows Weekly from Lisbon for the next I'll six bring my months. computer just in case, yeah. yeah. do. Bring, bring what you need. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly. I would hate to be stranded in Europe for a week. <laughs> would oh, be terrible. Heaven yeah. for fend. All right. Now, after all that, it is time, in fact, for the moment you've all been waiting for, the Windows 7... Feature of the week. Sort of, uh, that was yes. I was checking because you do a tip and a feature, but yep. this is the feature of the week. It is the feature of the week. So this week it's Windows gadgets. Um, I, I considered doing a, and I may still write an article on this. You know the the lost technologies of Windows. You know those things that are kind of in Windows that are just being left there to die. Edgar you know, Rice side, Burroughs presents side show and so forth. The lost technologies of Windows. Yeah, interesting. You should mention that author. Anyway, um, but Windows gadgets uh, appeared first in Windows Vista as part of the sidebar, and you know that itself has its own kind of convoluted history because the sidebar in the project that became Windows Seven Longhorn was a much bigger deal. Oh, was it? That than it was in the final version of Windows Vista. Yeah, the, the, the notion at the time was, when Microsoft was working on Longhorn, that all of the notifications for the system were gonna be over in the sidebar. They were gonna get rid of the notification area, and they were gonna get rid of the notion that individual apps could provide notifications in their own unique ways. You know, that everything would be centralized in this sidebar. And 
you know, again, you get, look, you have to look back the many, many years ago this was, but they were looking ahead, Microsoft was, and thinking, well, widescreen displays are becoming a big deal. We can take some of this real estate up with this sidebar and people won't notice that it's gone and it can be stuff that's always there and, and et cetera, et cetera. But the way Windows Vista came about was there was something called a sidebar there, but it had nothing to do with that Longhorn sidebar. It was a brand new uh, bit of software. And it hosted these kind of HTML uh, type uh, gadgets uh, that would run inside the sidebar. And again, you know, the, the basic concept was the same. These things would always be there to look at, you know, clocks, weather, uh, gadgets, you know, stock market utilities and things like that. Little, you know, little utilities like those desk accessories that were that were in the Mac, you know, many, many years ago. Um, well, wait a minute. Before there were desk accessories, there were uh, TSRs on uh, DOS. TSRs, so yeah. you yeah. really yeah. could well, say this started uh, in the with sense DOS. that they're visual. I'm not, yeah, I'm not giving Apple credit for inventing us. I'm saying, you know, from a visual perspective, there were little things that would run over on the right. side, you know, they would run side by Gadgets, side with widgets, doodads. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do hickeys, as, as it were. You know, I think Confabulator uh, really started this uh, as a third-party utility on the Mac. Yes, and actually, we're going to get to that too. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I'll shut up. Uh, yeah, please stop talking. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't have to say anything. <laughs> no, no. I'm done. Um, so when Windows I'll Seven, I'll just sip my lips now. Actually, if you could just <laughs> stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when you're done. I'm done. Okay. All yours, you sure? Paul. Yeah. <laughs> You just okay. take it from here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, in <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. In Windows 7, uh, the gadgets from the sidebar continue forward, but the sidebar doesn't. So the sidebar has been taken away. Um, the odd thing about that is that so many people complained about it. They got rid of it. But, of course, there's also this group of people that loves it and uh, they miss it. And I think it was last week we had a software pick of the week where you could bring a sidebar type experience back to Windows 7. But... For the most part, Microsoft expects you to run these things back on the desktop. So um, they accommodate the need to look at them in different ways in Windows 7. You know, we have something called Arrow's, Arrow Peak, um, where you can hide all the windows that are floating over the desktop. So you can see what's on the desktop, including those gadgets. Um, you could also use a keyboard control to get down there by default and so forth. They've made some concessions to kind of the modern uh, computing environment that is Windows 7. So, they're you know, the gadgets are all touch-enabled. They're... Um, uh, they have different sizes that are possible. So on a touch system, you can actually interact with the, the little uh, user interface controls and so forth. But for the most part, they really haven't changed that much since Windows Vista, which is too bad because I feel like uh, this Windows gadget system, like the similar uh, system on the Mac dashboard, I think it's called, um, is, is, you know, it's a decent idea. I think for a multitasking type system like Windows or Mac OS X, I mean, this type of thing I think makes some sense. Um, but... It clearly hasn't taken off in a huge way. So I would just say that if, you've got, if you're have if you used to Windows Vista, you're going to recognize almost all the gadgets. They're basically exactly the same. They've taken one or two away. They've added one or two. Um, if you're coming from Windows XP, of course, this is brand new. So it's something to, to look at. They're not enabled by default like they were in Windows Vista, so you'll have to enable them. And the easiest way to do that is just to right-click on the desktop and choose gadgets, and then you'll get that um, gadget explorer window, and it will give you the the list of available gadgets. You can place them around your desktop as you see fit. You can line them up on the side of the, the screen as you would in Windows Vista with the, with the sidebar as well. And then there's a link. Uh, I think it's in the show notes. Um, yeah. So there's a link also for uh, more gadgets that are available online, both from Microsoft and from uh, various third parties. How big is that ecosystem? It's not that big. I guess that's... It's not that big. When it's you not. say it comes up short, it really mars because just developers haven't embraced it as a platform. Yeah. And it's... And again, it's it's kind of hard to understand why because they're not hard to make you know they're they're it's not you don't have to uh install a professional programming suite and you know develop in c-sharp or anything like that i mean it's uh, basically web technology um it's odd to me that this hasn't really taken off and it seems like in windows 7 the whole gadget thing is is kind of treated as a second class citizen um i guess i I would just, if we could segue to the to the software pick of the week, um, one of the things I recommend is if you are interested in this kind of thing, it's worth evaluating both the system that's included in Windows, Windows gadgets, and also the competition, right? Because Yahoo makes something called Yahoo Widgets, which is what used to be Confabulator that you just mentioned. And also Google has something called Google Desktop. And uh, Google Desktop does a number of different things, but one of the things it can do optionally 
is display a sidebar on the side of the screen. And I think that both of those environments actually are, I would say, far better supported by third parties with regards to availability of gadgets and so forth. And, you know, if you're a Google person, if you use Gmail and Google Calendar and all that stuff, I mean, obviously, the Google, Cal the Google desktop version is going to have the types of gadgets that you're going to want. Um, the Yahoo one, uh, you know, this obviously there's some Yahoo stuff in there, but I think that uh, graphically speaking, the, the Yahoo widgets is probably the, the most graphically rich. I think it's probably the nicest looking uh, collection of uh, widgets or gadgets or however, you know, whatever you want to call these things. Um, but anyway, it's worth checking out, certainly. And I, I think my only fear for this kind of thing is if, you know, for the people who are fans of Windows gadgets, um, you've seen, you know, from Windows Vista to Windows 7 kind of a de-emphasis. You have to wonder what's going to happen now in the future. Uh, because a lot of these side initiatives around Windows gadgets also haven't taken off. You know, uh, Windows Sideshow is one of those notions of bringing uh, Windows gadgets type uh, software controls to these mini displays that maybe would be on the outside of uh, laptop cases or uh, auxiliary devices like uh, remote controls and so forth. And there have only been very limited attempts to take advantage of that stuff, and it really just hasn't gone anywhere. And I'm pretty sure it's in, it's in Windows just because, you know, they'd be sued by the one company that makes this stuff if they didn't <laughs> include it. I mean, it just isn't supported in any meaningful way, which is too bad, but... That's sort of where we're at. One of the most popular uh, tips you ever did, I think, yes, sir. Yep. was the Windows key. Uh, what was it? Win the one for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's all kinds of different. There's the, you know, arrow snap with the Windows keyboard, you know, but Windows key one, plus the... I can't remember what it was. It was... That you were, anyway, you, hmm? you got some special keyboard shortcuts. It's a sequel there's to some, that. Yeah, there's some crazy so popular ones. post. If ever there was a, a market for a book called Navigating Windows with a keyboard. <laughs> yeah, you know, no kidding. I would be, the, I would be the guy. Make it an interactive book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we had part of this tip a long, long time ago. But you know, now that we're using, uh, now that we're doing Windows Seven Tips of the Week, I thought it might be interesting to expand on it. Yeah, so, no, I think it's uh, great. Hussein, this Amiya, is all in a help file somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, it's got to be somewhere. So, <laughs> so yeah, sure. it's got to be. Yeah. Um, if you use Windows, and I don't remember what this dates back to, I, I want to say this is Windows Vista and 7 only, but I could be wrong. Um, if you look at your taskbar and you have this, uh, you know, group of icons down there, shortcuts, um, and you want to launch that first one. So on my computer screen, uh, the, the first icon, the first shortcut in my taskbar is for Windows Explorer. So if I want to run that thing, I can tap Windows key plus one right? Because it's the first one. And you can do that for the first 10, you know, Windows key plus two, plus three, plus four, all the way up to zero. And then once you hit 11 and out, there's actually no way that I know of anyway, uh, to launch those other ones. Now, we've kind of known about that's that. That's handy one. in and of itself. I mean, that's, that's just, yeah. A, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Now, there are certain classes of applications. Uh, Windows Explorer is a good example. A web browser is a good example. Uh, Notepad, Microsoft Word, things like that, where you may actually want to have another instance of that application running. So, for example, let me count in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The eighth one in for me is Microsoft Word. But Microsoft Word is already running. So if I hit um, uh, the Windows key plus eight, what I get is the little arrow peak, you know, thumbnail preview pops up because it's already, uh, actually, because I have more than one running. So that allows me to, more than one Word window running. That allows me to navigate between the available windows and choose one. So let me actually close one of these. I'm confused why I have two of those. Let's see what it does. So now that I have one Word window running and I hit Start Menu plus 8, right, what it does is it brings Word to the forefront because Word's already running, right? And interestingly, you can use it as a toggle. So if Word is already running and you want to hide it, you can oh. actually hit when key plus eight again, and it toggles it right between minimize. Too bad and there's minimize. not an easy way to know what eight is. You'd have to, you have to count it, exactly. In fact, one might make the argument, and I'm surprised Windows doesn't do this because it's so good at the, doing this elsewhere. If you hold down the Windows key and don't, oh yeah, it should show you. Uh, should let go of it. Up. It should show you a little pop up with yeah. the numbers. That would be really kind of handy, wouldn't it? Um, but there are other things you can do here. So if you want to open an ins a new instance of that app, you can hold down the Shift key. And, and then hit uh, Windows key plus eight in my case. And then you get a new Word window with a blank document inside. 
right? So that way you can, that's handy. you know, that's also uh, uh, handy. Now, the other thing you can do <laughs> is, again, you have multiple instances of a single application. You know, again, let's, we'll use Word in this case. Um, if you're in another, now you switch to another application. If you want to get back to the most recent window that you accessed in a particular application, you would hold down Control plus Windows key plus that number, right? So in my case, um, Control Start plus eight, and then they would bring back whichever of those Word windows oh. was most recently used. Okay. Right? So that lets you. So if you're working in something, you go back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Now, I would say these are <laughs> these are fairly esoteric in the sense that a lot of there's a lot to remember here i mean uh between the shifting and the controlling and you know and all that stuff i mean um and not to mention the numbers i don't think many people would be able to glance at the screen and say okay that one's number eight and go from there but i i suppose if you have managed your icons in such a way you would remember them now I and mean, one of the nice things about windows 7 is you can in fact organize the uh, order in which those buttons appear right so you would know that Word, in my case, is the eighth, the eighth one in, you know. Um, I threw in some other shortcuts that are based around the taskbar because I think some of these are kind of interesting. Uh, we talked about the show desktop and the arrow peak stuff if you want to get to your gadgets, right? Um, a lot of people know that uh, Windows key, actually, I screwed it up in the notes. I'm sorry. I wrote Alt plus D is show desktop. It's actually Windows key plus D. That's been in Windows for a long time. But if you do Windows key plus space in Windows 7, you get arrow peak. And that's kind of cool because you get that kind of that nice look through effect, right? Where you can see the outlines of the windows that are open. Do you have to keep holding it or is it a toggle? You, you hold down uh, the windows key and you tap arrow uh, the, the space. space. And it peaks, but it leaves the And peak once open. you let go of both of them, it goes away. Oh, okay. So it is. Okay. It's literally a peak. Right. Yeah. The difference between those two is that with show desktop, you're literally minimizing all windows. So once you, once you tap that, everything disappears and you're looking at the desktop. Now, you can get all the windows back the way they were before by doing it again, right? And that, but that's, I mean, Windows has worked that way for a long time. Um, I have a bunch here. I don't know if I want to go through all these, you know, from an auto, audio perspective. But some of the cooler ones include such things as, you know, Windows key plus T. Uh, this actually cycles through the taskbar thumbnails of every open window or running application that's listed in the taskbar. So as you, you know, you hold down the Windows key and hit T, and as you go, it actually goes across, and actually not just the open ones, but also the closed ones. So the, the closed ones, it just highlights the icon. The open ones, it actually shows you the thumbnail preview. It's pretty cool. It's, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a nifty hidden, hidden one as well. And then let me see if any of these other ones are any... Uh, yeah, I mean, most of, the, uh, most of the right... We've talked about some of these before. I mean, a lot of the other ones are, um, you know, ways to get at the properties for the underlying shortcut. You know, you hold down the... Uh, um, the shift key and click uh, to get like another instance of the, you know, of an application that's already running. There's a bunch of different, you know, things like that, but I, they're all in the show notes. You can go see them, but I, I basically collected all of the keyboard shortcuts. I know that are associated in some way, you know, with the taskbar, including arrow peak. And then uh, in the start menu, I think everyone knows, obviously if you just tap the start button, the start menu comes up. If you don't happen to have a start menu in keyboard, um, control plus escape does the same thing. Oh, I do. I do that a lot, actually. I used to do that all the time. Yeah. In fact, that's it. Cause yeah. I, I, I don't Windows know. Keys. When did they start putting menu keys on the keyboards? Because I, I remember to control escape for years. Sure. Uh, geez, I don't know. It's been a long time now, but we're getting old. They snuck them in. Yeah. Yeah. There is, I, you know, there used to be a help file. Like if you. Oh, it, I'm sure there still is. With, with like everything. It was like this yeah. a compendium. Right. Right. So, um. What is help? Control F1? It's just F1, I think. Of course, it depends on what application you're in. So you want to tap the keyboard. That's, the, that's the other problem is that many times applications override. Yeah, so if you, you can click a, an empty area of the right. desktop or the taskbar and hit F1. And let's see. Actually, right, not F1. the taskbar. Let's right. do the desktop. And we'll type keyboard. Yeah, if you just keyboard. do the desktop, you get the main Windows help and support window. Shortcuts. And actually, let's try it. Let's see what it says about navigation keyboard, keyboard shortcuts. Shortcuts. Hmm. Getting help content. Getting help. Yeah, they have plenty of. Uh, yeah, and actually, there are many application specific keyboard shortcuts as well. Media Center, Media right. Player, Internet right. Explorer. Very nice. Good stuff. 
I am ready for uh, a software pick of the week. We're going to get to that just a little bit before we do, though. We want well, to. We just did, actually, we did it. So I, I kind of tied it into the. The Yahoo Widgets Google Desktop thing? Yeah, yeah. That was it? Yep, that was it. Well, then we're going to do the thing that you're not supposed to ever do in life. <laughs> we're going to end with a commercial. But right after the commercial, Paul yeah. will reveal a secret way that you can get Windows and Office for free. Huh? No, you don't have to. I'm just trying to keep him listening. <laughs> yeah, I, I lied. I better start scrambling then. Shh. Yeah, you can come back and say, oh, that? No. <laughs> that Leo was it's wrong. It's like one of those Google ads and you click on it and it's some weird version of Linux with OpenOffice. <laughs> right. Not, oh, no. It's called he was, Redmond Linux. He, he, yeah, he was talking about, he was talking about uh, Chrome and, uh, and Google Docs. Princess right. of Mars. I can't believe you're going to recommend an Edgar Rice Burroughs book. And let's, read let's, I read these all when I was a kid. I loved Edgar Rice Burroughs. I read all the Tarzan novels. Let's let's talk about uh, Audible.com briefly, and we'll get your pick of the week here. Mm -hmm. Audible is, of course, besides being our sponsor uh, and, and, and for, have been for years, a great place to go to get audio books, entertainment of all kinds. 75,000 titles now in the Audible library and more all the time. It's, it's really an online bookstore of great audio books in every area. New releases, bestsellers, fiction, nonfiction, thrillers, romance, sci-fi, some great stuff. And uh, you can get your first book free. Just go to audible.com slash windows. And Paul's got a recommendation for, uh, I guess you'd call this sci-fi. Yeah, absolutely. Classic. It, what may be one of the earliest examples of sci-fi, yeah. you know? I mean, this thing is a hundred years old or more. Um, Edgar Rice Burroughs. He's the guy who created Tarzan. Yep. What's interesting about this to me, and and it's obviously, I, I'm, I'm going over, I'm reading it again. So it's been a long time, but I have the same feeling now that I had when I first read this, which is that for a book that is this old, it's surprisingly easy to get through, right? It's it's. Oh yeah, he was he was he was writing great popular fiction. Yeah, he was ahead of his time in many ways. But uh, this is the first of the John Carter books, uh, sometimes called, uh, they have other names, I guess, but the, the first, you know, Mars book, right? Uh, Princess of Mars. And uh, I, I, I really like it. it it's, uh, so Carter is a Civil War veteran who is yep. in Arizona and just weirdly gets transported to Mars by a triangular-shaped uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Lighted exactly. object. Yes. Five lights in a triangular <laughs> pattern. Looks like it's a actually, square. <laughs> there's more detail to my Arizona story than there is to his. But <laughs> somehow he, he gets Mars. to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> and so Mars is, of course, populated by six-legged animals and giant apes and whatever. And it's, uh, you know, it's an action story. And, and it's great because he's sort of a superhero when he gets there because of the gravity differences and so forth. And... Um, and in looking this up, you know, one of the things I do recall about this is that, of course, um, you know, the famous fantasy artist who just passed away, uh, Frazetta, Frazetta, you know, did a lot of the book covers you would have seen for these books, you know, in the 1960s, probably. Um, and these things are all available online. They're fantastic. But apparently they are actually making a, a movie of this as we speak. And I believe that it is a lot of the guys from Pixar that are working on it. And I think that the guy who did the Ooh. Finding Nemo story is doing the script. Oh, so this is very timely. Somebody's telling me too that uh, the Tarzan books were the uh, James Cam one of James Cameron's inspirations for Avatar. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, mean, sure. I guess if you think about it, it's the same plot, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny that you mentioned Tarzan because I I actually consider Tarzan as well. Um, these books, because of the day and age they were written. Um, are dated in some ways, especially along sort of uh, racial lines yeah. and so forth. Um, so the Tarzan books have some stuff in them. I think it may be a little, uh, <laughs> a little off, but... Um, I'm going to have to listen to this. Well, yeah, and you just have to take that in, you know, keep yeah. that in mind when you're listening. It's from a different era. It literally is from the 1800s, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to have to listen. I've never, you know, I, I mean, I've read all the Tarzan books. I may not have read the John Carter books. So... I, my recommendation is to, there are two different versions of it. I on see Audible. there's one with a real pot boiler cover here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's just the samples yet, um, but the they're a little robotic sounding. Right. Uh, 
It's just too bad. You know, these are from Blackstone Audio, and uh, it's funny. Uh, Audible has really, you know, kind of take, taken over for all of yeah. these book yeah. on tape companies. And Blackstone, I used to listen to a lot of Blackstone, and they weren't very good. Uh, they tended to hire people who were just reading it to get through it. Yeah, they did a lot of business. I'm, more, books I'm a little stuff. more concerned about the quality of the recording. You know, where it's, it's got that. Metallic oh tinny. well, don't worry about that because that's just the yeah. samples they have. Both yeah, of these are available thinking, in yeah. the new uh, E format, the enhanced, super high quality format. Yep. So that's so, not going to be an issue. Just make sure that yeah, I would listen, listen to, to the, the reader, not the sound. To both samples, right? And and pick the one that you I like. Picks. The Jimson does. Let me. This is the Jimson, which is the one you put, picked. Let me just hear a little bit of what the uh, yeah Jimson recording time. That if anything should happen to him, he wished me to take charge of his estate. And he gave me a key to a compartment in the safe, which... Yeah, you know, th that quality is just the uh, sample quality. Sometimes the samples, they use the older samples. It was, just, it was surprising because both of them just sounded really bad. Yeah. Yeah, they just use the older Personal samples. ...instructions, which he had me pledge myself to carry out with absolute fidelity. Neither of these readers sound super yeah. great. But, you know, so, what, in, what yeah, interesting... The story's fantastic. Well, that's the really thing. Is. The story's good. You forget the reader pretty quick. Yeah. You get subsumed. You know, and it depends on your leanings. I mean, we, we've talked a bit about how some of these books are almost stage productions, right? right. Where you have multiple actors and there's music and all that. Um, this is not that kind of book. And uh, I could see someone doing a book, a version of this book like that. But if you, if you tend more toward the, you know, single narrator uh, and you just kind of lose yourself in the story, I mean, I think that this will be fine, uh, I think, for you. But uh, again, it's, it is a fantastic story and it, it does... It's amazing, I think, how well it holds up. It's hard to imagine that this was written as long ago as it was. It really, it really is kind of interesting to me uh, that it, you know, that it holds up. I can't wait. I'm, I, I, I just dying to listen to this. Yeah, and this came out of again. I'm getting rid of stuff. So, as as I discard, you know, these paper books, there's some stuff I've had kicking around for a long, long time that I just haven't read in a long time, and I'm like, oh, geez, I got to go through this again and. And, you know, it's nice. I'm just surprised. Again, like I said, it, it, it really holds up. And it's one of those, a lot of the things that I enjoyed as a younger guy, you know, you, you whether they're TV shows or movies or books or whatever, you revisit them later and you're like, oh, what happened here? What you was know, I, I thinking? <laughs> geez. But this is a good one. I mean, it's a really good one. Well, I can't wait. I, I spent one summer reading all of the Tarzan novels when I was about, yeah. I don't know, 15, yeah, yeah, yeah. 13. I can't wait. Princess of Mars, Edgar Rice Burroughs. But, you know, you get 75,000 books to choose from. Certainly... There's something for everybody. If you go to audible.com slash windows, sign up today for the gold plan. First book's free, and you get to keep it at, at, even if you cancel at any time. Audible.com slash windows. We thank them so much for their support of Windows Weekly. Well, Pauly, uh, you're headed off to uh, get work, get to work on Windows Phone uh, mm -hmm. Secrets, the new book. You're going to have access to the Windows Phone. Uh, but now, don't worry. I won't, I won't pry. I should also have a Kin device next week. Oh, exciting. Finally. That you'll be able to talk That's, about. Yeah. I look forward to that. We should also uh, mention that we're going to change our record time. Normally we do the mm -hmm. Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern at 11 a.m. Pacific, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv. Thursdays yeah. is the regular day, but because Paul's traveling next week, we will do it on Wednesday. And we're still working on the time. It may be the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern. And it might be later because that's also the day the Google I.O. conference is. And we might swap you with This Week in Google and, yeah. and do Twitter. Yeah, if you want to go later, is fine. So we might do later, yeah. So Whatever you got to Watch the calendar. The best thing to do is if you go to live.twit.tv, there is a calendar there. Click the calendar button. And uh, that's kept up to today as best we are able. So that will have the uh, schedule of the shows. Thanks, Paul. Paul is uh, you, online at the Supersite for Windows. You can see him anytime there at winsupersite.com. And, of course, Windows IT Pro and the book Windows 7 Secrets. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly.